When I first visited Google's sprawling corporate headquarters in 2012, I felt like a kid entering Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. The company's campus in Mountain View, California, boasts state-of-the-art everything, with a bit of whimsy on top. As I wound my way between office buildings, I encountered beach volleyball courts, fanciful sculptures, a gift shop stocked with branded tchotchkes, and free world-class restaurants. It was stunning. Google had invited me and a group of other academics to its headquarters to attend a retreat for its senior human resources directors. But I couldn't help wondering what this company, one of the world's most innovative and successful, could possibly need from us. The smiling employees whizzing by on bikes painted in the primary colors of their company's logo certainly didn't look like they had any problems. Google had raked in $38 billion in revenue the year before my visit. But everyone has problems, even Google. The company had convened the retreat to find new ways to help its employees make better decisions, both at work and at home, with a particular emphasis on improving their productivity as well as their health and financial security, both of which have been linked to improved work performance. Midway through the event, Prasad Seti, a Wharton alum and Google vice president who had been in human resources for several years, asked me a seemingly innocuous question that would set me on the path to one of my most significant discoveries. Google, he explained, offered its employees a wide range of benefits and programs designed to make their lives and jobs better and to solve such problems as undersaving for retirement, overuse of social media, physical inactivity, unhealthy eating, and smoking. But oddly enough, these programs weren't widely used. Prasad was both puzzled and frustrated that so many programs his team had created, which Google paid dearly for, went largely ignored. Why weren't employees clamoring to take advantage of free skill-building classes? Why weren't they all signing up for the company's 401k match and personal trainers? Prasad had considered a few possible explanations, all of them plausible enough. Maybe the programs were being poorly advertised. Or maybe employees were just too busy to take advantage of them. But he also wondered about timing. Did I know, he asked, when Google should encourage employees to take advantage of these resources? Was there some ideal moment on the calendar in someone's career to encourage behavior change? I paused. Prasad's question was clearly important. And yet, to my knowledge, Academics had largely overlooked it. If we hoped to effectively promote behavior change, of course we would need to understand when to begin. Although I didn't have an easy answer for Prasad, I did have a hunch. I told him that before I could offer a reply grounded in solid evidence, I would need to review the academic literature and gather some data of my own. I started itching to get back to my research team in Philadelphia. The power of a blank slate. Prasad was hardly the first leader I'd met who was perplexed by the stubborn persistence of unhealthy or unproductive behavior. I've spent countless hours talking with frustrated public health officials about how to reduce smoking, boost physical activity, improve diets, and increase vaccinations. And that's just for starters. I often hear the same exasperated plea. If you can't persuade people to alter their behavior by telling them that change is simple, cheap, and good for them, what magical ingredient will do the trick? This book will offer many answers to that question. The most important being, it depends. But one is particularly relevant to Prasad's problem. It starts with a remarkable medical success story. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, SIDS is every bit as terrifying as it sounds. Each year, tens of thousands of babies around the world die suddenly and inexplicably while sleeping. For years, SIDS has been a leading cause of death among infants in the United States between one month and one year of age. I remember being petrified when my pediatrician explained the risk factors during a checkup for my newborn son. For decades, the medical establishment was at a loss over what to do about SIDS. But then, in the early 1990s, researchers made a major breakthrough. They discovered that infants put to sleep on their backs died of SIDS 
at half the rate of babies put to sleep on their stomachs. Half. This was a discovery worthy of celebration and fast action. It presented an opportunity to save hundreds of thousands of lives. So naturally, the public health community wasted no time spreading the word. The U.S. government launched an ambitious back-to-sleep campaign to educate new parents about the importance of placing babies to sleep on their backs. The National Institutes of Health flooded the airwaves with commercials and filled hospitals and doctor's offices with brochures. Of course, there was no guarantee of success. Many such campaigns fail, which explains my frequent phone calls with frustrated public health officials. Just consider the recent high-profile attempt to reduce obesity by requiring calorie labeling in chain restaurants. It turns out that telling people how many calories are in a Big Mac or a Frappuccino reduces calorie consumption, well, essentially not at all. Or consider the efforts by U.S. health authorities, starting in 2010, to persuade Americans to get annual flu shots. The effects have been minimal at best. 43% of Americans now get flu shots, up from 39% before the policy was implemented. So there was every reason to expect that the back-to-sleep campaign would be the same old story, making only a small dent in a massive problem. <laughs> 